join me in your Bibles, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 14 this evening. I recently happened upon an online discussion where people were recounting times they forgot someone else's name and how they tried to figure it out. Most of the stories people shared were complete backfires. My favorite was a woman who wrote, instead of telling a man that I couldn't remember his name, I said, I can't remember how to pronounce your name. (laughs) To which the man responded, Bob. (laughs) You pronounce it Bob. (laughs) Another woman shared, my neighbors called me by the wrong name, but I didn't correct them because I forgot their names the second they told me. We've lived right across the street from each other for over five years and still do, do not know each other's names. One woman shared her shock at her husband's way of rectifying the situation. She wrote, My husband was just talking to a casual acquaintance whose name he couldn't remember, so he said, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. And the guy told him his name. I didn't know you could do that. (laughs) Now admit it, there's probably been a time or two in your life where you find yourself in this awkward situation to try and figure out a good way to sort it out without the person knowing or realizing that you forgot their name. We have a well-intentioned desire to make sure that the other person knows we haven't forgotten them or that we don't care about them. So the last thing most people want to do is ask, who are you? This is one of the reasons having a pictorial directory for the church is so helpful. Now, as we continue looking at the Exodus, we come to a very well-known and very important text that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. We saw last time that God brought a major distraction into Moses' life as he was herding sheep in Midian for his father-in-law, Jethro. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and the bush was not being consumed. And so, remember, Moses approached the bush, and then the angel of the Lord called out to him, Moses, Moses. And he went even closer, and immediately he was told to remove his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. And then the angel told him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And now as we move further along in the narrative, God gives Moses a glimpse of what he has been up to. But Moses comes to that time in the conversation where he has to ask, what is your name? I don't know your name, and you want me to do this thing that you're calling me to do, but who do I say that you are? It's one of the most significant passages in all of Scripture because in just a few short words, God reveals to us one of the most important things that we can know about him and his existence and how he functions in the world that he has created. So let's read together and discover the name that God gives, beginning in verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? 
He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is, your na- what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Well, the first thing we see in verses seven through nine is what the text really has been teaching us all along, that even when he seems distant, God knows your affliction, he knows your suffering, and he knows your oppression. I've pointed us back to the end of chapter two several times over the last few weeks, but it is the beginning of an important theme that develops in these early chapters of Exodus. Look again at verses 23 through 25 of chapter two. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So after hundreds of years in Egypt, it was probably a foregone conclusion in the minds of the Israelites that God had forgotten about them. That the promises he made with Abraham concerning them were no longer in sight. But we are told that while they may think that's true, God was with them and God was watching all along. And then in verse 6, God identifies himself as the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is an even more direct indication that God has not forgotten He remembers his people. He is their God. And so now we get into verse seven and for the first time, the Lord says out loud what we only know because the narrator told us before. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. God is saying what we have already considered. I hear, I remember, I see, and I know. In other words, this is not the beginning of God's plan. God has been working his plan all along, and the plan is to rescue his people and bring them to the land that he promised them hundreds of years prior, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, more than likely, this isn't a reference to actual milk and actual honey. Milk can also refer to fat and honey can refer to sap. So we're not talking about cows and bees here most likely, but probably it's more a more pleasant and concise way, a poetic way of saying it's a good land and I'm giving it to you because I've made the promise that I will fulfill. It's a fruitful land. It will provide for the needs of God's people, a far cry from the land of Egypt. So the Lord tells Moses, trust me, I've seen, I've seen what the evil taskmasters are doing. They are abusing my people. I hear them crying out. I know they are suffering, but I want to tell you what I'm doing, Moses. I'm coming down to deliver them and I'm going to bring them to the land that I promised to your fathers. The land may have many other people living there now, but the cry of my people has reached my ear and I will not stand by and let it continue. They are oppressed and I will rescue them. In other words, I've been here all along. I've never left. I've never forgotten my promise. And now is the appointed time to move forward with my plan. The Israelites did not know The Israelites thought they had been forgotten. 
but God continues to work. <clears throat> I've mentioned William Cooper before. He was a gifted hymn writer, and he was uh, cared for and discipled a lot by uh, John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, but William Cooper also wrote numerous hymns that we sing here, songs like God Moves in a Mysterious Way. But Cooper's life was lived under a massive dark cloud of depression and a sense of loneliness and abandonment. And it really comes out in his letters and his journals, his interactions with John Newton especially. He once wrote these words to him on January 13th, 1784. It's a lengthy quote, but I think it's helpful as we think about this. He said, Loaded as my life is with despair, I have no such comfort as would result from a supposed probability of better things to come were it once ended. You will tell me that this cold gloom will be succeeded by a cheerful spring and endeavor to encourage me to hope for a spiritual change resembling it. But it will be lost labor. Nature revives again, but a soul once slain lives no more. My friends, I now expect that I shall see yet again. They think it necessary to the existence of divine truth that he who once had possession of it should never finally lose it. I admit the solidarity of this reasoning in every case but my own. And why not in my own? God's ways are mysterious. He gives no account of his matters. An answer that would serve my purpose as well as theirs that use it. There is a mystery in my destruction and in time it shall be explained. In other words, Cooper in writing to John Newton is saying, I believe, I believe in the truth of the perseverance of the saints. I believe I was converted and justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ, but I do not believe that I am included as those whom God saves to the end. I am the lone exception in all the universe. I was once elect, but now I'm reprobate, and God does not owe an explanation to me. It is all up to him. It's a sad conclusion. Cooper's life is a very sad story, but I suspect to some degree that some who are sitting here right now who have had or currently may have some questions as to whether or not God has forgotten you, whether or not God has left you all together. I'm reminded of the words of King David in Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Have you ever felt completely and utterly abandoned by God? You may not want to admit it out loud, but in your heart have you said to the Lord, how long? Will you forget me forever? Was I once one of yours, but now I am not? Brothers and sisters, we have yet another reminder here of the great truth that is contained in the promise that was given to us by our Lord Jesus. I will never, I will never leave you or forsake you. He is with us at all times. And in all places, the Holy Spirit dwells within us and among us and says, even when you're losing hope, even when you feel empty, even when you think I've turned my eye or my ear from you, I am here. I am with you. I am for you. I know what you face and I know what you are going through. As I I've said recently, this is why it is so important for us to rely on what we know to be true from the scriptures, from God's holy, infallible, inspired word, and not rely on our feelings. We can have some bad days when it comes to our feelings. And if we rely on our feelings, we're going to be in this, this constant flux in our minds and our hearts as to whether or not we think God loves us and cares about us and is with us and is watching over us. Don't rely on your feelings. They are fickle and unreliable. 
rely on the truth of what we see in God's word. We also have to remember that our timeline is not God's timeline. Sometimes we may endure hardships and sufferings well beyond what we think is reasonable. But God's purposes are greater than ours. God's plans are more important than ours. God's design is perfect and his ends are are far more glorious than anything we could ever hope or imagine. Remember, God promised in the garden that the head of the serpent would be crushed. The heel of the woman's seed would likewise be crushed, but it was 4,000 years later, at least, before that ever happened. The Lord never forgets his promises. He never forgets his people. He never abandons those whom he loves. So we can take heart, brothers and sisters, even when he seems distant, God knows your affliction. He knows your suffering and he knows your oppression. And so the cry of your heart may be, how long? But God's response is, I've been here with you all along. Trust me, trust me. Well, he goes on in verses 10 through 12 to show us that when God calls you, he accompanies you. Now remember at this point, it's likely that the thought of having anything else to do with the Israelites was far out of Moses' mind. He tried to help them, remember when he was still in Egypt, but he messed it up. He acted on his own. And so what did he do? He moved on. He, he fled and started a new life in a new place with a new people. He was married now and he had a family of his own. He had new responsibilities. And so the last thing he expected was to encounter the Lord in a burning bush and to hear, come and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Can you imagine what he was thinking? I, we, I think this is a story we are all so familiar with it and we think of Moses as a giant of the faith and we certainly should, but Remember, he's, he's just herding sheep. And it's been, it's been 40 years since he left Egypt. And now all of a sudden, he's already shocked by the sight of this burning bush and the voice that comes from the angel of the Lord. But now he says, by the way, you're going to go and you're going to be the one who talks to Pharaoh to get my entire nation of people out of the land of Egypt. What was he thinking? Excuse me? Those, those people hate me. I can't, I can't go back there. I can't do this. I've moved on. That's why he said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Lord, listen, I know that you know that I killed an Egyptian and I was found out. They put a bounty out for me. And so I'm, I'm here, I'm in Midian. I had to get away from that. And now you want me to go? Who am I? Why would you want me to do that? Besides, at this point, Moses was about 80 years old. He was about 40 years old until he decided he was going to try and free the Israelites And when he killed the Egyptian, and now we fast forward about 40 years after that, every 40 years, it seems like something significant happened. When I turned 40, I moved here to pastor at EBC. Every 40 years, very significant. So the Pharaoh that is in power now is is not the one in whose home Moses grew up in. Remember, we read at the end of chapter two that that Pharaoh had died. But this is a new Pharaoh, and it's very possible that the people in Egypt had forgotten him entirely. This is 40 years later. No wonder he asked, who am I to do this? We may scoff and think it unwise of Moses to ask such a question. After all, he knows at this point that he's talking to God, but let's not think so highly of ourselves that we wouldn't ask the same questions. After all, he wasn't asking him to just run down to the store and grab a carton of eggs. He's telling him that he will be the means that is used to deliver an entire population of people out of vicious slavery. Of course you would wonder, 
how in the world is this going to happen? You want me to march up to the king of this land, one of the largest nations in the world at this time, and tell him, these people got to go. I'll be killed on the spot. But the 400 years of servitude and affliction had run their course, and the hour of divine intervention had struck. The children of Israel had probably long abandoned any hope for the land of Canaan, but their affliction had become unbearable. So the time was ripe to finally renew their minds with the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey. The captive people will be emancipated. The nation of slaves will be liberated. Sure, God could have struck Pharaoh down in an instant and installed a Pharaoh favorable to the Israelites and simply let them go. He could have done that. He could have sent forth his angels in a single night to destroy the entire nation of Egypt. He could have appeared to all the Israelites as the angel of the Lord and brought them out of their house of bondage. He could have done any of those things and many more. But these were not God's plans. God called Moses. And this is how God normally works. He uses human instruments. You and I are called by God to this very same work. Now you may not think of yourself as a Moses figure, but in many ways you are. You are called to tell others that they are in slavery to sin, that they are in bondage to their self-will and their self-righteousness and their evil intentions. They are in bondage to the world and to their own flesh and to the devil. But there is a promised land and God will deliver them. If they follow you as you follow Christ, they too can know the truth of a land of milk and honey. They too can drink from the well that gives water that quenches every thirst and eat of the bread that relieves every hunger. They too can look to Jesus Christ and live. This is God's way. And he calls all of his people to this great work. No, we will not likely be called to declare before world leaders that we are, uh, that, that we are taking their slaves from them. We may never have the opportunity to take an entire nation by the hand and lead them to the promise. But one-on-one, In our daily encounters, we do have opportunities to be God's means to bring sinners out of bondage into liberty, from death to life. And so Moses, in many ways, we can look at and see ourselves in this call and in the confusion when we have fear about telling others about the gospel. Me? Who am I? I'm going to mess it up. I don't have words to say. Well, God says, I am with you. Moses' response to the angel of the Lord reminds me of Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. It says, as they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, the point is that when a man acts according to his own will, he, he clears out all of the difficulties that he may see in his way. Think of planning for a trip. Tomorrow, I'm leaving. I'll be gone for two weeks out of the country, and so there's a lot of planning that goes on beforehand. Is everything ready? Did I forget to pack anything? Are the bills paid? Did I get all the things I need to get? Are my lecture notes ready? Are the, are, are the emails and all the messages finalized so people aren't waiting another two weeks to hear from me? And on and on it goes. But, but we will make all of the preparations so we can go and know that the plans are set and everything is taken care of. I have things I'm doing. I have places I'm going. I have everything set. And on and on it goes. But we, we do this 
And yet, this is how we think it's always going to be. Sometimes there's a call from God to go, and we have immediate questions. Me? You want me to go? But I I have things I'm doing. I have preparations to make. I have places to go. I I don't have everything set and ready. I, I, I think maybe you actually don't mean me at all, but someone else. But instead of rebuking Moses for his question or rebuking us when we are unsure, the Lord gives an assurance. In verse 12, he said, but I will be with you and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. I'm not gonna deal with that statement much tonight. We will look at it in later texts, but... God gives this assurance. Yes, Moses, you will go. It is you I am calling. But don't worry, I will be with you. Brothers and sisters, when God calls you, he doesn't send you out on your own and say, good luck. No, he accompanies you. He goes with you. The almighty God of the universe who created all things and sustains all things is with you. Such was the case with Moses and the prophets and the apostles and every pastor and missionary today or every Christian who gets a knot in their stomach and a lump in their throat when it comes to time to tell someone else about Jesus. Is this really my job? We may have doubts. We may have reservations. But we need to be reminded, God is with me. What do I have to fear? What are they going to do to me? The worst they could do to me is kill me. And then I'm with Jesus. I'm doing his will according to his word. Look, it may be like it was for Isaiah. And you're you're going to talk to a stubborn and stiff-necked people who are blind and deaf to the truth. It may be like the apostles who were imprisoned and killed for preaching the gospel. It may be like the thousands upon thousands of Christian martyrs throughout the centuries who have died in Christ because they refused to bend their knee to any other king. But God was with them and God is with us. No doubt Moses felt what the apostle Paul expressed. Who is sufficient for these things? Well, the truth is none of us are. But by the power of God, the Holy Spirit within us, and by the accompanying presence of God in all that we do, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to hide. And every reason is given to us to walk in obedience because we know that his will is being done and he will receive all the glory. And so take heart, child of God, and remember the unfailing promise of God. I will be with you. And so who is this God who makes this promise? We see in verses 13 and 14, the God who knows your name is the eternally self-existent God of all creation. It is once again no surprise that Moses wanted some assurances. Verse 13, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? In other words, what is your name? Who are you? Now, of course, he knows it was God, but at this point, God really wasn't much more of a a thought to Moses. He never had any kind of real encounter with him at this point, at least that he knew of. Many commentators suggest that Moses' encounter with the angel of the Lord at the burning bush was Moses' time of conversion. I think that's a compelling conclusion. So of course he's going to ask, what is your name? It wasn't like he was going to stroll into Egypt and go right up to the Pharaoh and say, listen, I know you're important, I know you're powerful, but you got to believe me, the angel came in this burning bush and it was not consumed and he told me to tell you to let his people go. So can you do that? (laughs) 
And then he was going to turn to the Israelites and say, Hey, everyone, I talked to the angel of the Lord. He said we're all getting out of here, so let's go. Don't worry about Pharaoh. Don't worry about your taskmasters. He's going to take care of all that for us. No, his question is a reasonable question. God, you want me to do all of this? I need to be able to tell them exactly who you are. Tell me what to say. Now, no doubt the people would ask, who is this God that you speak of? Prove to us that he is worthy of our confidence. Now, at that point, most of the Israelites had likely fallen even into the idolatry of Egypt. They very likely had little or no thought at all of God, of the God of their fathers. Remember, 400 years, how many generations have, have lived without any thought or any mention of God and his covenant promises? They would need to be reminded, who is he? And so God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, this is likely a very familiar verse to most of you. We have to acknowledge that it is pregnant with meaning. It has been debated through the centuries. What does it actually mean? How should it actually be translated? Essentially, God is giving Moses the Hebrew verb to be. That's it. So this could be translated, tell them that being itself has sent you. It's really a fascinating thing that he says because here's what it means. He's saying, I have no beginning, I have no end, I always was, I always am, I always will be. There was never a time that could be said I wasn't and there will never be a time that can be said I will be. I am. In theological terms, we call this the aseity of God or the, the absolute self-sufficiency of God, or the, the self-existence of God. God had no cause. God is the uncreated creator of all things, and he has never depended on anything or anyone but himself. The aseity of God. Now, I've talked about this with my kids from time to time, and we all agree in our home that it's, it's pretty easy for us to think about the fact that God will always be in the future, that he has no end, I can conceive of that. We can wrap our minds around that, but the thought that God has no beginning, that he always has been, that just makes my brain want to explode. But this is very important. Think about it cosmologically. It's rather, it's rather baffling to me, honestly, at this point, that science departments still teach the theory that everything exists out of nothing ex nihilo, out of nothing. Okay, so maybe you can conceive that the earth and other planets came into being by a big bang. All of the right ingredients were out there and they collided at just the right time in just the right place in a dark, lifeless, gravityless space to bring earth into existence with gravity, with breathable air, with habitable temperatures and water and land and the seeds of life for plants and animals. It spins around the sun at just the right speed so nothing goes flying off and no other planet that exists is just like it. Fine, for the sake of argument, I'll grant you that. But the next question is, where did all the matter that collided come from? And where did the elements that make up that matter that collided to bring about the Big Bang come from? You see, the cosmological argument for God is just this. If we, create, if we trace creation back to its origin, at some point, a person who rejects God has to conclude that there was a time when there was nothing whatsoever. And if there wasn't a time when there was nothing whatsoever, then how is it possible that everything that we need to bring about what, it, what now exists just existed? It really sheds light on what Paul says when he tells us that there are those who claim to be wise but are fools. Now, of course, we are the ones who are dumb for believing in God, but I have to be honest. 
I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I believe in an ever-present, uncreated, eternal God who created all things by the power of his word. Everything else that exists in the natural world is caused by something else. No being in the material, natural world comes into existence out of nothing. It's impossible. Nor is there anything in the material world that has ever been shown to be eternal. In the natural world, everything has a cause. And so the natural world must have a supernatural cause. There must be an uncaused cause. There must be some supernatural being that caused us. If there is no God, and the universe came into existence out of nothing, we are then dealing with a scientific impossibility, which by definition is called a miracle. So maybe atheists actually do believe in miracles after all. But the reality is that we have an uncreated, eternal God who created all things. He gives us life and breath and all our being and that is the most humbling reality in the universe. It takes all the hot air out of our big heads because we realize that we are dependent. There's no such thing as an independent man or an independent woman. We are all dependent on our creator and our sustainer. And when you finally get over what that does to your pride, it's one of the most liberating truths that you can know to be true. Why? Because you now know that keeping the earth on its axis and keeping the stars in the sky and regulating the temperature of the earth is not up to you. It's not you who's holding life together. So you can relax. And you can take a deep breath and you can realize that I am has done it all and continues to do it all for his glory and for your good. But there's another layer to God's aseity that makes it even more personal for us. There are plenty of world religions that teach that God is the creator, that all that exists comes from his hand. Most religions would affirm that Paul, uh, what Paul says in Acts 17, that in him we live and move and have our being. But Christianity is the only religion that teaches what the Bible tells us, namely that God is not just an impersonal force. He doesn't just exist out there and he creates everything and he sort of sets it all into motion and then he sits back and watches us and judges us whether we're good or we're bad by what we say or what we do. That's what the world religions generally teach. No, our God is a personal God who is involved in the everyday affairs of his creation. Even more specifically, he knows you by name. He knows the most intimate details about you that even you don't know, and he cares. He loves you, and he takes care of you. Consider what the Bible says, Isaiah 43, 1, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Psalm 139, 1 through 4. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. We're told in Luke chapter 12 and verse 7, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Psalm 56, 8, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? You see, when we have a knowledge of God that reaches down to the hairs of our head and realize that he is the one who created you and knows you by name and loves you and takes care of you, when you know the fullness and kindness of God who has given you all that you have and has made you to be all that you are, there is no reason to fear. There is no reason to be anxious. There is no reason to ask why. 
or where are you? He's here. He always has been and he always will be. He is with you, dear Christian, and he's not going anywhere. But let's even go one step further. It's powerful and it's encouraging and it's life-giving to know about this God, but it's even greater to know God, to experience God, to encounter the fire of God and to have him call you by name and to say to you, you are mine. Now that happens, of course, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, Jesus has one of his many encounters with the religious leaders of his day. And beginning in verse 48, the text says, the Jews asked Jesus, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Who, who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you have said he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And so the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The angel of the Lord in that burning bush was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ the second person of the Trinity, the divine logos, always has been and always will be. And that's what he's telling the religious leaders. And that's why they wanted to kill him. He was claiming to be none other than the divine, eternal, everlasting God of all creation. There's a Christmas hymn by William Billings and one of the stanzas of the song says this, seek not in courts or palaces nor ro royal curtains draw, but search the stable, see your God extended on the straw. The royal guest you entertain is not of common birth, but second in the great I am, the God of heaven and earth. The second in the great I am, that's Jesus. And that's exactly what he was saying to the Pharisees. The great I am, in the words of the apostle John, was the word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Just as the angel of the Lord said to the Israelites in verse 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land, he says to us today, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Friend, if you are not a Christian, if you have not had a personal experience with the great I am, the Lord Jesus Christ, he invites you to come and find peace and find rest in him. Come to me, he says, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friend, whether you recognize it or not, truly, you are a slave. You are a slave to your sin. You are a slave to the world. You are a slave to the own, your own desires of your flesh. You are a slave to the devil himself. But there is an emancipation from slavery that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ who sets the captives free. And he invites you. Friend, by faith alone, you can come to the Lord Jesus you can trust that his perfect life was lived on your behalf, 
that his death was died on your behalf, taking upon himself the penalty that is due to your sins, that he was buried in the grave and raised three days later to conquer sin and death, that you might have everlasting life. And that God, that great I am, says, come to me. Come to me, trust me, believe in me, rest in me, and I will give you everlasting life. Imagine it. Imagine that the one who is everlasting, the one who never had a beginning and never has an end, that he invites us to dwell with him for all eternity in the future. What a glorious blessing. What a wonderful thought. At this time on the earth, when we toil and we struggle and we ask in our weakness, how long, O Lord, how long? When we wonder, has he abandoned us? Has he left us? And and have to be reminded he is with us that one day, in only a short while, we will be with him forever and never question again where he is because the radiance of his glory will shine throughout the skies of the new heavens and the new earth, and we will sun ourselves in him forever and ever. And so, brothers and sisters, may we always find rest and joy and peace in the great I am, the one who always was and always will be, the one who knows us by name, the one who calls us to follow him, that we might live lives that glorify him and are for our very own good. We have a great God. We have every reason to rejoice. And so may it be, brothers and sisters, that we never dwell on the why or the when or the how, but remember that God hears and he sees and he remembers and he knows. Trust him, rest in him. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are so very grateful for your word. We're thankful that we can come to you, the great I am, and know that we are not praying into the void, that we are not speaking to a distant, uninterested being, but that we have a God who knows everything about us. And as your children, that you have called us by name out of darkness into light. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to trust that even in our darkest days, when we feel alone and abandoned, to remember the promises of your word, that you are with us, that you will not leave us, that you will not forsake us, that you will not abandon your promises. Help us, O God to trust in the great I am. Lord, we pray for anyone here tonight who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would be pleased to awaken them to new life, to come to the end of themselves, to submit and humble themselves to the one who creates and sustains all things. Lord, only you can do that, and we pray you would do that very work this very hour, that you would be glorified and we could all rejoice. And we ask that you would do these things in the powerful and precious and holy name of the great I am, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.